Buenos dias. I'm very sorry to give the presentation in uh, English. Um, estoy aprendiendo, aprendiendo en español. Y el español no está bastante bien para dar la presentación en español. Um, so it's a great pleasure to be here. Yeah. And um, thank you very much for inviting me. And thank you very much for being here this uh, morning. Well, <laughs> So, um, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to talk about sustainable corporate governance. And uh, first of all, I'm going to tell you what I understand behind the term sustainable corporate governance. And it would be great if you could have maybe a discussion after my presentation about um, your vision of sustainable corporate governance. And uh, in a second instance, I'm going to propose ways, two ways of achieving sustainable corporate governance. And um, the first way is going to be via increasing diversity in the boardroom. And I'm going to um, say a few words about how that's going to work and why diversity matters. And then the second way is about choosing possibly the right owners for your business. So this is about enabling versus impeding owners in terms of sustainable corporate governance. So that's the, um, the idea of my talk. So first of all, I'd like to talk or start this presentation with a quote. And uh, it is actually a quote by two academics and they're both women, okay, so just mention this, but um, they were writing in 2016 that increasing gender diversity in energy decision-making will distribute political power and influence to encourage a more sustainable society. So first of all, are they right? Are women or increasing diversity in decision-making rooms, is this an important step towards a sustainable society? So that's something which I'm going to try and address in what's going to follow, but, um, I would also like to say that um, their understanding of sustainability is mainly about environmental sustainability. And I'm going to extend, extend my view on sustainability. So I'm going to look at sustainability much more broadly defined than environmental sustainability. <laughs> so uh, what is sustainable corporate governance? Well, there are lots of papers out there that talk about sustainability, sustainable corporate governance, and in a nutshell, I'd say there are three main definitions of sustainable corporate governance. And three main definitions are, one of them I'll talk or refer to as the cake, and I'll let you know in a moment why. I like cake, but that's uh, one reason, but there's a more profound reason behind that. And the second definition is going to be what I call weathering storms. And then finally, um, I ran out of imagination. And my third definition is just what it is. It's the United Nations definition of sustainability. So let's start with the first one, the K. So in a way, this is um, stakeholder capitalism. So this is the, um, the approach that businesses are not just about um, shareholder value creation, but 
they should also consider the interests of their key stakeholders when making decisions. So there are some who criticize this approach and say stakeholder capitalism is impossible because the size of the cake is fixed. So if you treat your employees better, if you give them a bigger slice of the cake, then this means that the part of the cake that goes to the shelters is going to be much reduced. So in other words, your gain is my loss and vice versa, my gain is your loss. But then um, there are also others, um, especially um, in academic circles, who argue that if you treat your stakeholders well, then your stakeholders are going to be loyal, more loyal to your business. Um, if you treat your employees well, your employees will be more productive, will be more loyal, etc. So good stakeholder react, um, management or relations means that your cake is going to be bigger than it would otherwise be. So in other words, a bigger cake, more productive employees is going to benefit everybody, not just your stakeholders, your employees are being treated better, but it's also going to benefit your shareholders in the end. So it's a win-win situation. The second definition is more of a systemic view of corporate governance. And um, this view of corporate governance has two aims. First of all, it's about making sure that corporations are well governed, so they're well governed enough to sustain or to, um, to face shocks, outside shocks, such as economic and financial crisis. And then a second aim, which is related to the first one, is to make sure that businesses don't destabilize the economy. So this is about avoiding um, waste, serials of uh, corporate failures, corporate scandals, which are going to have an effect on the economy as a whole. And then um, finally, we've got another definition, which is the United uh, Nations definition. And this is a definition which is much, much broader than the first two definitions. And it goes back to the Frontline Commission which was set up in the late 1980s by the United Nations. This commission published a report, and in this report, it defined sustainability as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So in other words, this is about stakeholders, but in contrast to the very first um, definition, this is about a much broader set of stakeholders. So it's about existing stakeholders, generations who exist at present, but it's also about future generations. So generations or uh, stakeholders that haven't been born as yet. Given the remit of the United Nations, the report talked a lot about reducing <coughs> poverty on, on, on a global basis. And it also talked about what it's uh, called environmental stress and reducing environmental stress. So what is environmental stress about? Well, first of all, it's about the well-off. The well-off, as they become richer, spend more and more of limited natural resources. And that puts a stress on the environment. Secondly, it's also about the very poor in society. And, and what the very poor in society very often have to do is they have to destroy their environment and environment around them to survive. But for example, they might have to uh, engage in deforestation to have wood um, to cook, to heat their houses, etc. So this is a, a very broad definition, and I'm sure you know this uh, definition was also the basis for the 17 Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, and they were also adopted by the UNPI in their work. So we've got three definitions of sustainable corporate governance. Importantly, uh, these definitions are not mutually exclusive, and there's actually a lot of overlap between these three different definitions. And something that all of these three definitions agree on is to focus on the long-term. So this is about the long-term, long-term value creation rather than short-term shareholder value creation. So what's wrong with the focus on the short term? 
Well, it's relatively easy to increase profits in the short run, but this might come at the cost of long-term shareholder value, and at its very extreme, this could result in a reduced chance of survival for the business. Obviously, this would harm not just the stakeholders, but it would also harm the shareholders, the owners of the business. So the third definition is the broadest definition of them all. So it encompasses, but includes, or covers first two definitions, stakeholder definition, definition about systemic stability. And remember, it also covers a much broader um, set of stakeholders. So it covers existing, but also future stakeholders. And um, it also looks at how the firm index with its uh, broader environment or ecosystem. So this um, leads me to my own definition of sustainable corp governance. So I define sustainable corp governance as a set of arrangements that ensure that the firm focuses on maximizing long-term shareholder value, which goes hand in hand with the consideration of broader stakeholder interests in the firm's decision-making. So the focus on, on the long-term or long-term shareholder value creation does not only enhance the survival of the firm, but it also promotes the preservation of the firm's ecosystem. So how, how can we move towards um, long-term shareholder value? How can we get more resilient businesses? And how can we move to a greater stakeholder orientation of businesses? So I propose two ways forward. And the first way is by improved diversity in the boardrooms. And my second way is via having supportive or enable, enabling owners or shareholders behind your business. So question to all of you, um, what does the academic evidence tell us about the effect of gender diversity on firm value or performance? What, what do you think? Is the effect positive, negative or neutral? <laughs> well, uh, most studies actually find no effect. So some studies find a positive effect, but there are also studies that find a negative effect. So kind of disappointing, but there's a big methodological issues in research, and that's androgeneity. So in other words, correlation is not necessarily the same as causation. And um, I actually had trouble finding some of the earlier studies. And this is a study by Privy Suisse from 2012. And they looked at gender diversity and corporate performance. And they, um, they actually did something very, very simple. I'm not sure you can see that very well, but um, you've got um, a red line, the red line, is the share price performance of firms with female directors. And the blue line is the share price performance of uh, firms without female directors. And they looked at two types of firms. So they looked at uh, large firms and smaller firms. And you can see that uh, the red line, at least after a certain time, so from about 2008 onwards, is always higher than the blue line. And they concluded that um, these results show the superior share price performance for the companies with one or more women on the board. So what's, what's wrong with that conclusion? Well, it could be the case that if, if you're a highly qualified woman, so you're in demand, you're in demand for, for being in a boardroom, you might actually pick out a better firm rather than a badly performing firm. So, you know, causality could go the other way. Women have got the choice, they're in demand, and they could pick out the more, um, the better performing firms. Another issue is that um, it's, it's relatively easy to measure short term child value creation, and that's what this study did, but it's much more difficult <coughs> to measure long term uh, financial or child value creation. But, so I've been quite negative so far. And I'm going to have a whole presentation about increasing diversity in the boardroom. So 
I've got myself into some kind of situation here. But uh, in a moment, we're going to see that um, gender diversity still has an effect on financial performance, but it's an indirect effect. It's not a direct effect. And I'm going to show you um, how this works. So this goes by a better corporate governance and also by uh, improved uh, decision-making, so improved quality of decision-making. And there are plenty of studies, um, for example, that show that firms with streamer directors have <coughs> better corporate governance quality. So uh, firms with streamer directors put more emphasis on monitoring, monitoring the executives of the business, and this is reflected in more um, board meetings per year. So these boards meet more often than boards with just male directors on that. The attendance at these uh, board meetings is also better. And that applies to both male directors and female directors. So more meetings and uh, a better attendance rate at these meetings. And then uh, some of my own research found that um, firms with female directors tend to impose higher dividends in firms with otherwise weaker corporate governance. So they try to get out money out of these firms, pay back to the shareholders because they might be worried that the management might waste these shareholder funds on that project. What about improved quality of decision-making? Well, here there are also lots of studies and uh, there are some studies that suggest that firms with female directors make fewer acquisitions, and if they make acquisitions, they make these acquisitions at better terms, so at better prices for the acquiring firm. Some of my <coughs> research also has suggested that um, female directors reduce cognitive biases in a boardroom. And this was a study which looked at male CEO overconfidence. So that trait, Male CEOs is much reduced when they're female directors in the board. So these um, better corporate governance practices, uh, improved quality of decision making, also reflected in, in other practices. So, for example, they reflected in more informative accounting figures. So, accounting figures are more informative because there's less earnings management in firms with female directors, firms with female directors also engage in less aggressive tax management. They're also less likely to, to engage in uh, corporate misconduct, um, another malpractices. They're also less likely to be engaging in corporate fraud. And finally, firms with female directors are more likely to do something about risks that they perceive uh, to, to be there for their business. So what, what about the greater uh, stakeholder orientation? And why would there be greater stakeholder orientation if we've got women in a boardroom? Well, looking at the social psychology uh, literature, there are two possible reasons. The first reason is that um, women define morality and ethics in a different way for men. For women, morality is about the grand challenges of society. So the big issues in society and their part in tackling these grand challenges. What about man? Well, for man, morality and ethics is about their rights versus the rights of other people. So that's the first difference between genders. Second difference between genders is helping behavior. For man, helping behavior is about the now, and it's a heroic action, like jumping into a building which is on fire and saving whoever is in that building. So it's heroic, it's highly visible, but it's about the now, the very short term. What about women? Well, for women, uh, helping um, behavior is about something more long-term and also something which is done behind closed doors. So it's, for example, about helping us an elderly relative or looking after uh, a relative child which is uh, long, ill in a long-term way. So it's less visible, much more long-term. And this 
also seems to be uh, reflected or, or applied to female directors. So firms with female directors tend to have a greater stakeholder orientation. So they are less likely to engage in business practices that um, CSR rating agencies consider to be negative. So the ratings of these firms with female directors are better. They also disclose more information about, um, or voluntary information about CSR, and the market reacts much more positive to that voluntary disclosure of CSR. So the market seems to trust women more than they trust men when it goes down to voluntary disclosure of CSR. They also engage in less downsizing of their workforce. And um, there's also a study which found that uh, firms with female directors are more likely to help victims of natural disasters. <laughs> So are female directors more concerned about one particular aspect of sustainability, and that's environmental sustainability? Well, again, uh, we've got lots of studies that seem to suggest that this is indeed the case. The firms with female directors have better environmental uh, CSR ratings, and uh, such firms are also less likely to be um, sued in a court of law for environmental issues, environmental access. Some of my own research, um, so this was research on US firms in the S&P 500. So that research suggested that uh, firms with female directors are more likely to use renewable energy. So they use renewable energy in a, in a greater proportion of their total energy consumption. Funny, um, I'd like to talk about the owners, the shareholders of the business. So I've talked a lot about boardroom and boardroom being of a diverse way and taking the right decisions, being subject to good uh, governance practices. But what about shareholders? What about different types of shareholders? And what about uh, the evidence? What does it tell us about stakeholder orientation and also the focus on the long-term versus the short-term value creation of different types of shareholders. So I'm going to look at um, a whole series of different types of shareholders, and that's the ones. Um, tell me which one is the worst one in this list. In terms of both stakeholder, Robert. sorry? Uh, it's not the government, no. No, hedge funds, hedge funds. And I'll start with hedge funds, um, hedge fund activists. So what's wrong about hedge funds? Well, first of all, um, they're actually quite good because remember I talked about systemic, uh, systemic corporate governance, making firms resilient um, to shocks. So they actually pick out the bad guys. So they tend to focus on firms with weak corporate governance. And very often they sort out the corporate governance. They also, uh, in some cases, kick out COs that uh, uh, destroy rather than create shareholder value. So on the whole, they create shareholder value, but they do well on that, uh, in that sense. But there are also studies that suggest that that shareholder value comes at the cost of bondholders, so the gains the shareholders make result in equivalent losses on the bondholder side. And there are also some studies that suggest that, that shareholder value creation comes to the detriment to the loss of the employees. So bad stakeholder um, orientation, but it gets worse because some hedge funds have been uh, picking on firms with extremely high levels of corporate social responsibility and tried to push down that CSR to industry levels, to average industry levels. And that's why I put this um, very bottom of my diagram, where they focus on the short term when it comes to value creation, and uh, they also tend to have a relatively low stakeholder orientation. What about private equity houses? 
So private equity houses um, would be investors who um, concentrate, focus on mature firms, and they take these firms off the stock market, so they take them private. What's really important here is to consider the different types of private equity transactions. So you've got management buyouts, so this, um, this is the existing management, which takes the firm private, so no change of management. Then we've got management buy-ins, so these are outside managers who take the firm private, kick out the old management, and then finally, there are also institutional buyouts. So institutional buyouts are going private transactions, which are entirely managed by the private equity houses. And they put in place our management, again, uh, provoking a change of management in the targeted firms. So they, they create value, shareholder value, short to long-term shareholder value for sure. But on the employee side, there's some studies that suggest that while well, MBOs are generally positive, they actually increase the working conditions of the employees. This is not the case for MBIs and IBOs. So there are some studies that suggest that there might be excessive downsizing in firms that are subject to MBIs and IBOs. So that's why I put them somewhere in the middle of stakeholder orientation. It depends on the type of private equity transaction, and they also tend to be in a firm for three, possibly five years. What about venture capitalists? So venture capitalists are also private equity investor, but um, I tend to make a difference here and they tend to focus on um, young firms, so they invest in firms before these firms have gone to the stock market. So young firms, high growth firms, early stage firms. They are, you know, the archetypal activist shareholder. They don't just provide the funding for their firms, but they also provide advice, strategic advice, operational advice, They've got resources, networks that they make open uh, to their um, investing firms. And very importantly, they also sit on the board of directors of their firms. So they're very active. There are lots of studies out there that um, agree that they create child value. They actually make a positive difference. But um, there are also some studies out there that suggest that possibly younger VC firms might be subject to conflict of interest. Why would this be the case? Well, VC firms are in a form of private partnership. And um, silent partners typically provide financing in stages. And to obtain more funding, what you have to do as a VC is take one of your investment firms to the stock market. So if you're a young VC, you might uh, want to rush this going public. And if you rush um, a firm to the stock market, this would come at the cost of high underpricing at the initial public offering. So all the benefits go to you as a young VC firm, but the costs, the high underpricing at the time of going public is going to be shared across all of the shareholders, not just the VC, but all of the pre IPO shareholders. So I place venture capitalists uh, somewhere the very long term, but I wasn't entirely sure about their stakeholder orientation. Let's put them in the middle. Sovereign wealth funds. So they've been on, on, on the up since the 1980s, 1990s. And the problem here is that this is actually quite a diverse group of investors. So on one side, we've got the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund. This fund has got a clear ethical focus and it seems to have very strong stakeholder orientation. There are some studies uh, have suggested that after the 2008 financial crisis, firms with uh, ownership by the Norwegian fund were less likely to downsize their workforce than other firms. So stakeholder orientation, but if you look at other SWFs, for example, SWFs from China, the Gulf region, other areas of Asia, they very often have very different aims. So they don't have this ethical focus. And one of the aims may be to, to acquire foreign technology, 
to get access to natural resources in other countries to be um, a means of increasing your political power abroad. So generally speaking, there doesn't seem to be a, a link between SWF ownership and CSR performance. So I'll place them to the very left in terms of stakeholder orientation. Institutional investors, and uh, remember I, I talked about um, correlation versus uh, causality early on. This is where everything just becomes a complete mess if you look at empirical studies. So there are some studies that suggest that institutional investors increase financial performance, so they're good when, for their investing firms. They, they also improve the corporate governance of their investing firms, but then there are also studies that suggest that they are bad. So they only focus on the next dividend. They uh, put too much pressure on managers, resulting in greater incidence of financial fraud in firms that have institutional ownership. Nevertheless, when we talk about CSR, the link between institutional ownership and CSR is typically positive. But, and I think this is very interesting, institutional investors prefer companies with average levels of CSR. They don't like companies with very low levels of CSR, and they also don't like companies with very high levels of CSR. So I'll place them um, somewhere in the middle of, of the diagram. I'm also focusing on banks. Um, so banks are an institutional uh, investor, but I'm picking them out because uh, traditionally at least, banks have been very important in some countries, some corporate government systems. For example, the French system, German system, and also the Japanese system. They, they've been important in these systems in two ways. Um, obviously as a lender, the debt holder, but they've also held stakes, the equity stakes in uh, firms that are listed on the stock market. Unfortunately, and similar to institutional investors, um, the empirical evidence is inconclusive. So there are some studies that suggest banks are good in terms of financial performance. Uh, other studies suggest there's no link. And then you have more studies that suggest that there's a negative relationship between bank ownership and firm performance. But when we get down to CSR, studies seem to suggest that there's a positive link between CSR and bank ownership. So firms that have banks as their shareholders seem to uh, perform better <coughs> in terms of corporate social responsibility. Family shareholders, family firms. Family firms are very different from other firms because uh, typically the controlling family is interested in keeping control of their firm over several generations of the firm. So they are interested in the long term and they adopt a long term horizon when it comes to their firm rather than a short term horizon. What about the financial performance of family firms? Well, in a nutshell, first generation family firms seem to outperform other firms. So these other firms do really, really well. But when we get down to the second or third, etc., generation of family firms, family firms seem to perform worse than other firms. The generation of the family really, really matters. Nevertheless, on the positive side, there's a lot of very strong evidence that firms with a family shareholder have got higher levels of CSR and also environmental responsibility than non-family firms. So place them at the top, long-term, very long-term, and also high levels of stakeholder orientation. And then finally, government. I'm talking about um, government firms and um, part privatized government firms. So typically after the privatization, financial performance of these firms improves. And um, importantly, if the government stays in the firm after the privatization, these firms tend to make more long-term investments. The horizon of governments tends to be longer than the horizon of some other shareholders, and at least on the investment side. Government-owned firms also have better CSR levels, and 
this positive effect even persists after the government has completely sold out of these firms. So there seems to be a history or persistence of this positive effect. So I'll put the governments at the right in terms of stakeholder orientation and somewhere in the middle in terms of shareholder value. And that's, that's it pretty much. So that's my reflection on different types of owners and their stakeholder orientation and also their focus on the long-term versus short-term value creation. So I believe that um, in order to move to, towards a more sustainable society, it's important to bring more diversity into boardrooms. And I talked a lot about gender diversity because that's why we've got lots of studies. But um, I think we should also think about diversity more broadly speaking. So not just gender diversity, but also national, cultural, religious, political, etc. diversity. And I think it's not just about the boardrooms, but we should also talk about different types of owners and whether they're good in terms of moving towards a more sustainable society or whether they actually slow us down uh, moving towards a more sustainable society. Thank you very much for listening. Um, have we still got time yeah. for questions?